Hi, and welcome to this Getting Started video in Hasura, where we're gonna have a look at the console. We're gonna go through every part of the console to help you understand what does what, where it's located, and how to find your way through all of these options. Now, every option we have in the console is also available in the metadata. Everything you can do here, you can define in a infrastructure as code approach or a declarative metadata style for your CI CD pipelines, for your offline to cloud deployment strategies. And so everything here is available inside of the metadata. In fact, there are usually newer features released in metadata before they even make it into the console. So if there's something that you're really looking for that's cutting edge, it might even be already available inside of the metadata. That being said, we're gonna go ahead and dive into the console now and have a look at all the different parts. Some of these will be cloud specific, some of these will be generic to the open source as well as the hosted version. I'm hoping to be able to declare those to you, which ones are which, and we'll, we'll start the tour. All right, we are here inside the console, and this is gonna be the first view that you're gonna typically see, and this is the API Explorer page. Now, if we start at the very, very top, we're gonna to notice that there are two different API Explorer tabs. There is the graphical interface, and then there is the REST interface. Here under the RESTified endpoints, we'll see some persisted GraphQL requests that we have gone ahead and saved for uh, finding later on. Moving back over to the graphical interface, this is a very typical view for most GraphQL tools. We have the ability to use Explorer, we have the ability to uh, browse history, but a couple of unique features we have is this Analyze tab, and this will allow you to see the generated SQL statement that is happening under the hood. This will give you the understanding with permissions applied what is being requested from your database. This is an extremely helpful tool to figure out exactly where you may be having performance slowdowns and be able to create optimized queries for your, for your system. Starting at the top of the interface though, we do have our graphical endpoint. We have the ability to turn on a relay endpoint as well. Uh, we have the ability to provide custom headers such as authorization tokens if you wanna test out your JWT strategy and you have the ability to apply things like roles and uh, users. It's important to note that if you aren't actually using a bearer token and you're trying to test out roles and users, if you're doing something uh, like the typical XS or a role, if you're using something like the typical XS or a role here and you're wanting to apply a role such as user, you'll need to actually keep that XS or admin secret turned on because this is going to be re replacing the need for a signed secret from the from the console side to the uh, live side. But for now, we're gonna leave this uh, as is, and we can continue to move down to the rest of the interface. You'll also note that you have access to your admin secret here, should you ever need to be able to copy that using the little uh, I button over here to turn that on, which will allow you to be able to use this inside of like a server or a protected environment. Though a better strategy would be to create JWTs for those external services. If you want to view mutations, all you need to do is either toggle between mutations or subscriptions here, or what you can do is simply start off typing mutation and then begin your queries such as inserts, and then you'll see all of the available mutations that you have, and the same is true for subscriptions as well. If we go to the history tab here, we'll see that we can actually preview uh, previous queries we've done in the past. We have the uh, my query example here. And if I toggle the cache tab here, we'll see that it actually creates the at cache directive that allows me to be able to test what a cached response would look like. First response, non-cached. And we can see the response uh, time was 843 milliseconds. If I do that again, we'll see some substantial savings in terms of performance. Moving on down the line, we can also see that we have the ability for code exporter here. This is a nice ability to create uh, handlers where we would be able to run this query from a number of different uh, clients, as well as the ability to derive an action from this query, where if we were to give it parameterized inputs, we'd be able to uh, create an action, but that's getting ahead of ourselves just a little bit. Moving to the right hand side here, we'll see that we have two new tabs here that are the allow lists and security. Allow lists allow us to save any of these queries that we've already seen, as well as maybe some specific ones as only being the named queries that are allowed to be executed against our system. This is a great way to lock down the interface even further so that people can only execute queries that you have previously given explicit permission for. 
Speaking of permissions, we can actually see some of our existing roles here where we're able to define roles uh, that would be allowed for specific permissions. Let's go ahead and create a new role here called user. And we'll turn this on and we'll see that now only the, only the user has access to the allowed queries collection. We can add additional collections here such as mobile clients. And this would be a separate collection that would allow us to have specific operations that we would want to say uh, are only allowed from mobile clients, which we could again provide specific permissions for as well. This is a great way to lock down your API so that only those permissions that are required get access. Moving over to security, we can come over and see that we have global settings for the rest of our APIs. We have the ability to turn on or off schema introspection or for specific roles. We have the ability to set uh, depth limits, node limits, rate limits, timeouts, and batch requests for specific users as well. This is very helpful, especially when it comes to depth limits so that we don't allow, for example, anonymous users to be able to just create any number of, of nesting that they would want to for our system. To modify these settings, we need to first click on the global settings. Here we can enable specific rules for the, for the different levels. Here I'm going to turn on the depth limits for the depth limits for the API settings and I'm going to limit this to 5. You'll also note that we can set specific limitations based on unique uh, headers as well as IP address or even session variables. When I go ahead and I save this, we'll see that now I have a depth limit on my global settings. If I go to my, for example, users now, I could give them a specific custom limit on this depth limit to something such as maybe 2. This is a really great way to make sure that you're not over exhausting your resources for your underlying data sources. The security settings are limited to the cloud environments, though we do have free tiers available. Let's move on to the data tab. The data tab is where I can connect all of my databases. We'll see we're already on the manage view here where we could connect a new database by providing the different inputs, such as the display name that we'd want to use, the different connection protocols that are created. We could either use an environment variable to be able to define the connection string, the database URL, or manually provide the connection parameters. And at the bottom, we can see that once we've selected an actual data source, we can customize the behavior by providing a namespace or by giving a specific type name, prefix, or suffix. We also have the option to create a new database using our integration partners, such as Neon. Moving over to the left-hand column again, we have the SQL settings here. And this is, a, this is very much a basic SQL interface for your database where you're able to select the data source you want to modify. And this will run true SQL against your, your database. So use this with caution. This is not any kind of protected or, or scratch environment. This will run whatever you run here inside of your database. These two options below here for tracking will allow you to automatically track, uh, create table statements or create function statements to add those immediately to your API. Cascading metadata will go ahead and update the rest of your metadata if you've changed things such as the name of a table, which will then allow the rest of the metadata to be updated. Under the individual data sources themselves, we also have the ability to create tables. We can insert new tables as well and name them. We can give specific column values. You'll see our frequently used columns field here, which allows us to create a number of frequently used columns, such as an incrementing timestamp for created at or updated at complete with database triggers. This will depend a lot on the actual data source that you're using, but it's a very helpful utility to have. We can also define foreign keys, which is a very helpful mechanism for building out foreign key relationships, as well as working with defining our unique keys or providing check constraints so that we don't get ourselves into, so we don't get ourselves into any data issues. Clicking on an existing table, we have the ability to view the, the inserted rows. We also have the ability to export data. We also have the ability to filter down the existing content that we have. We can provide a simple first name filter here where we would tell it that it has any of the less than or equal to or any of the types of, of content that we would want to work with. We can use the simple I like operator here to perform a really basic check against something such as AI. And there we have Daisy. If we go to the insert row, 
We have the ability to insert new data into our database. We also have the ability to modify the, the table's existing schema. And we have the ability to look at the uh, attached computed fields, which would be dynamically updated references for returning real-time results. Relationships allow us to connect three different kinds of relationships. We have table relationships for inter-database relations between two, two or more tables. We have the ability to define external remote database relationships between, between more than one database. And we have the ability to make a remote schema relationship, which actually connects a remote schema. And under the permissions tab, we have the ability to modify any existing permissions. If we go ahead and we click on something like user here, we'll see the ability to provide custom checks that would allow us to provide incoming data such as that the username or the email has to be equal to an incoming variable such as the user email address as a header. We can define fine-grained controls across the different columns that the user has access to. And specifically when it comes to update, we're also able to provide things such as post-update and pre-update checks, which allow us to create data uh, sanitation practices. Heading over to actions, we have the ability to create custom business logic handlers where we identify a microservice that runs on an external system. We give it a name, we provide the name of the root, we provide the, the input types and the output types as well as then modifying the outgoing request. For more information on the actions, we have a lot of documentation on this, and you can see one of our additional videos in the Getting Started Guide. Remote schemas is where you can attach an additional, an additional GraphQL API. And event triggers allow us to define uh, conditions where a table is updated and it fires off a behavior at an external system. Monitoring is an additional cloud-only service. This allows us to have a look at our running environment where we're able to see all the incoming requests. We have the ability to look at our data. We have the ability to see any live connected web sockets. And we have the ability to view things like allow list, API limits, and run regression tests. If we move over to the settings tab here, we'll see that we have the ability to look at the metadata status where we can either export or import metadata. We have the ability to reload the metadata if our database or our underlying data sources become a little bit out of sync. We can reload all databases by themselves or also all remote schemas. This is helpful if you created a change to your external system. Resetting the metadata puts everything back at ground zero and this is something to use with extreme caution. We can also see all of our existing allow lists as well as about the actual server that we're running. We have the ability to enable insecure TLS allow lists and we have the ability to turn on specific feature flags. Heading to the, uh, to the inherited roles is the last feature we'd wanna have a look at and this would allow us to create uh, new roles that have combined functionalities such as generic user, which would have access to both the permissions of an anonymous user as well as a authorized user. We can save that and the generic user will become available. If there's any information that needs to be shared with the community, you can click on the bell icon here. If you need help with anything inside of the project, this will take you to our help page. And that wraps up the majority of information here for the console. The last place to have a look is over on the cloud specific projects over at the actual cloud dashboard. Here you can go to the general tab. You'll see everything there is to know about your, your running project, including the ability to rename your project and the ability to see who the owners are, adding in additional users, seeing what your tier is, as well as being able to copy your admin secret. Under collaborators, you can add new collaborators. Environment variables allow you to define both new or existing environment variables. If it's one of the ones that we recognize, you'll see them listed below. Domains allow you to be able to use custom domains for your project and Git Deploy allows you to work with the CI-CD pipeline for Hasura metadata. The usage tab will show you your current usage of the project and then integrations allow you to work with one of our many existing services such as Datadog, Prometheus, or OpenTelemetry. Okay, that was the whirlwind tour of the Hasura console. Hopefully you were able to see where the different pieces sit and hopefully this gives you an understanding of how to make your project a reality.